Welcome to another episode of the Wealth Building Strategies Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Constantino. And today we have on as a guest a former NFL lineman for the Tennessee Titans who has turned to real estate. So welcome to the show, Yannick Cujo Virgil. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on the show. Um I was an NFL linebacker, so I haven't. Uh, wasn't I wasn't that heavy? <laughs> back, <laughs> what back did, I, did I say? Lineman? I'm sorry. Yeah, lineman. I, well, I was a defensive <laughs> lineman slash linebacker, so I guess you can kind of call me that. But uh, no, sorry I appreciate this, you uh, having sorry me. Sorry for this. So thank you. Yeah, sorry for the uh, mix up there. So linebacker. Yeah, that's right. I, I was looking in uh, in your um, in your records for uh, was it Seton Hall that you started out in college? Yeah, Seton Hill. Yep. Seton Hill. Okay. And you have yeah. the record for the, the the school record for the most amount of uh block kicks? block PAT block attempts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, honestly, it's something that I really always forget that I actually do have. Like I hold the school record for something. You know, it's <laughs> that's something that I actually like achieve. And um I, it kind of gets overshadowed because I've actually like played most of my years at Maryland. At the at the Division One level, so like that Division Two year was kind of like to me like a a JUCO year in a sense where like you don't really like think about it. It was just like a time that you had to endure to kind of get to the next phase. But thank you for bringing that back to me because I, I anytime people say that, I'm like, well, yeah, you are right. I do have a record, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I saw on there you had two in one game. Yeah, 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 definitely. I I had a hot hand, so yeah. Excited about that. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we're talking real estate and that's what this podcast is about. And, you know, I, I started this podcast, uh, me and my business partner did, uh, Tony Preston, with the purpose of of simply educating people out there that there's um, there's a different way to invest. There's different ways to invest other than in the stock market, um, specifically with real estate and real estate syndication. So how how did you get into real estate? Yeah, so I read Rich Dad Poor Dad like everyone else, <laughs> and um, it was one of those things where it was given to me. Actually, I don't really know how I got it. All I know is I read it, and re- literally, like the month prior, I spent like twenty thousand dollars in one month in the off season, and I still to this day have no idea what I spent it on. And it's one of those things where. You hear it all the time in professional sports, you know, 70% of NBA or NFL athletes go broke within two to three years or three to five years of leaving their respective sport. And that book taught me one thing. It was, it's not how much you make, it's about how much you keep. And we live in a world in the professional athletic space where you get paid tons and tons of money in a short, short period of time. Like I literally went from a, being a broke college student to making six figures, you know, on the mid to high end in one year. And, um, you know, I was always taught to save, but I wasn't really taught to invest. You know, my mom, my parents, they had enough to kind of get by and, and make ends meet, but it didn't have enough to actually invest. So I had to just teach myself that from education, YouTube University, Google University, <laughs> all of the things that are out there in today's world to kind of help millennials, which is, you know, I'm a part of the millennial kind of group, um, invest today. So um, that is kind of part of my journey. I started off in brokerage, uh, jumped into private equity, and then I became a full-time syndicator a few months ago and started, you know, started doing some fix and flipping you know, on the onset of my real estate career as well, transitioned into the world of syndication, syndicating multifamily in Baltimore City. And, um, you know, we, we've done a couple of deals and, you know, we're excited for the future. So what what point in your journey did you stumble across Rich Dad, Poor Dad? You, you may have said it. This I, I was, was when I was rehabbing my knee and I was trying to figure out, you know, what was my next step? Mm. Because I had no idea, like, like my goal was to play 10 years in the NFL and just retire off into the sunset. And when you have that stop to your your dreams and your goals and your future, it's kind of like, I mean, think about it, right? Like some of your listeners might be health, you know, work in the health space. Some may, may be tech, some may be like, um, you know, whatever that, that, that there might be, right? Like think about if you were, 
unable to work. Like if your job, you, you, you couldn't do your job anymore. Like you had to start from ground zero. Like that's tough for anybody, you know, and to get it, to make it to the NFL, to the top of your sport, is no different from being, uh, you know, at the top of your game in the world of tech or in the world of, uh, of, of, of manufacturing or, or energy or wherever that, whatever space that you work in. Right. So like anybody is going to have some sort of shock to their system when they're dealing with their job and they can't work in that field anymore. And you have to basically pivot to figure out like, how are you going to feed your family? And what's the next thing to do? Right. And, and, and we kind of like soften it down because Hey, it's, you know, professional athletics and these guys make a lot of money, which is, you know, which is true, but from a, from a um, humanistic kind of approach, um, anyone is going to have challenges with that mentally. So, um, that is something that, um, you know, I had to deal with. Unfortunately, I latched on to Rich Dad Poor Dad and um, it helped me get into real estate today. What were some of the things in the book that that you that resonated with you and, and that you said, wow, this could be a potential career path for me? Um, Honestly, it was, as I mentioned, it's not how much you make, how much you keep, but the the way that he just talked about real estate, it really latched on to me as a way to just transition and put some money to work because, you know, as you already know, re- you know, real estate has a ton of benefits outside of the tax benefits. And when you look at it, all of the folks who are, multi-millionaires, billionaires likely have real estate as their core foundation of their investment portfolio, right? I look at real estate the same way, you know, at, at the end of the day, whatever investing I might be doing, it might be cryptocurrency, it might be investing in the business, real estate is always going to be my foundation and things that I can pass on because not only are you able to pass on cash flow, but pass on wealth as well, right? When we talk about a step up in basis, Whenever you you pass away and your heirs inherit your real estate, yep. so um, it's it's a foundational thing to me. Yep. So um, out when you were reading that, did you have a family already with any kids, or do you have family with kids right now? No, no. So I'm still I'm engaged right now. Oh, okay. Congratulations. No, there you go. I appreciate it. Yeah. No, no, no kids. No, no anything. And that's the beauty about it when you're um, an entrepreneur is that you you get to have some sort of flexibility and then you have five kids. So you have a ton of responsibility there, but um, you know, you get a little bit of flexibility. So, you know, in the future that'll, that'll come down the line. We just need, I tell my fiance all the time, we need some more cash flow (laughs) before we can afford that. So the reason why I'm asking that is because you're in your profession in in entertainment and NFL. And if you would have had, children at that time with a wife and then all of a sudden you can't be the breadwinner and you can't bring home cash that yeah you know you're at you're fortunate that you weren't at that position yet that you could you could uh that your expenses are probably a lot lower than if you had a big family yeah yeah definitely definitely um and that's one of the things that professional athletes get uh in trouble with too right is because they when their sport ends and when they get released or they can't play anymore because they got hurt they are unable to keep up with those bills. Like they get into liabilities, homes, cars, all the things that have recurring payments on them. And they don't have that cash flow coming out of line to keep up. And so over time, you know, once you have those assets that keep piling and piling and piling, and you don't have the financial um, um, ability to, to, to to redirect and, and, and change things up within um, your financial picture, and then you also kind of keep spending how you're spending. You, you keep with that lifestyle. Over time, you're going to go broke. So yeah. a lot of what we do is just the educational piece of just introducing them to right. um, investing. And you can still do what you want to do. You can still go to Miami. You can still buy those Rolls Royces and those fancy cars. Like I like to say, you know, if you ever been to a professional athlete's uh, um, facility, the, the 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 car lot is like a car show. You see, <laughs> you see the Mercedes, you see the Ferraris, you see all the expensive cars. You can still do that. You just need cash flow to offset that expense, and you'll be okay. 
So, so I played um, baseball in um, college at the University of o- Oklahoma, and you know, in college, you know, I'm I'm gonna ask, a, ask you a question, but in college, um, you know, uh, as an athlete, the in the locker room, you know, there's there's only one focus. You know, you're you're out there having yeah. fun, and th- there's only certain things that guys think about in the locker rooms. And uh, investing in real estate is not even mentioned or even talk talked about so yeah i'm wondering as you go older and grow into professional sports i'm going to ask you in the locker room and in your friends in the nfl how many people are talking about investments and cash flow uh, and side businesses is it is there even a, a talk about that or is it just party have good time try to win championships well i'll tell you one thing you know the, the modern the image of the modern day athlete is changing Right. Okay. So okay. you remember, I know you probably saw that 30 for 30, like broke. Right. Um, where I think it was like Antoine Walker, like he made like a hundred million and like lost it all or something like that. Um, I think back then the image and the attitude of a, of a professional athlete is completely different to, the, to today's environment. So back then they didn't have like social media. They didn't have a lot of the, um, easy access to off the field opportunities and information, and um, some yeah some of the things that, that that athletes have today, right? If you take a look at the modern day athlete, we look at like LeBron James, the Tom Brady's of the world, the, the Kobe Bryant, um, you know Serena Williams, like all of the athletes you know that actually invest their money, and so you know how it is as an athlete, right? Athletes hang with athletes, athletes do what other athletes do. And so now you're starting to see a lot of a lot of the excitement around um, and their interest in investing because such and such does it a couple you know um, lockers down right or you see LeBron James do it he's the first like billion billion dollar athlete um, you know I'm going to do it too because that's cool right that's what that's that's what I'm trying to get to now, that status is what I'm trying to get to so I think the to sum it up you know. Those conversations are definitely being had more uh, frequently, and I think over time we're going to start to see um, the rise of the professional athletes and um, and their ability to affect their finances in a, a more positive manner, as opposed to what have what they have historically been been uh, look, looked at. That's good. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I've been wondering that, and and I, I go back to being in college as well. So I'm engineering degree. And even going through engineering degree, basic um, profit and loss statements, balance sheets, uh, positive cash flow, you know, getting out of the rat race, all those things that are talked about in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that that's not discussed in college, in the college world at all. So you, yeah. you're taught to go be a good employee for an employer, um, but the world of investing is exactly what you're saying. It's Google university, YouTube university. And that's just kind of where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think today more than ever, there's no excuse for like not being educated, honestly, because you can follow someone on social media. You can find a video. Like if I wanted to be a plumber tomorrow, I can go on YouTube and Google like how to be a plumber. And I'm pretty sure I can find the basics behind like how to be a plumber. And I think if we're able to, if, if you're able to just utilize technology to just learn and, and understand that it can be done, um, I think that's half of the battle, right? Learning and education is one thing, but then you have to take action and go actually do it. I think that's the next step if you want to create financial freedom. Yeah, it's um, these last... 10 years or so. So I, I've been investing in real estate since 2005 and um, I actually started syndicating in 2015. But what happened was in 2012, the Jobs Act passed so that syndicators can advertise uh, publicly and have that 506C uh, uh, Reg D exemption. And so now syndicators are advertising using um, advertisements, Facebook, social media, and so now there's a lot more awareness about the possibility of an investor investing passively in the commercial real estate, which, you know, f- go back 15 years, 
you would have to have been next to that guy in the locker, you know, and next to LeBron or next to whatever NFL be and, and know their deal that they're on. And so there was a lot more uh, close knit um, yeah. syndicators and syndi- and you just have to be in the club to, to invest. But now it's pretty much available to the general public. Um, yeah. You gotta yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And that's, that's the beauty of our industry is being able to provide those investment opportunities to, people who are just um, working their lives and they just want to kind of trust a professional like, like, like yourself to, to be the manager of their, their wealth, right. And their capital. So um, that's really why I love this business is that you really get to have that double bottom eye, which is income and impact within your investing. Right. So I guess what kind of um, real estate projects and deals are you working on now and what you've, what in the last couple of years, what have you been working on? Yeah, yeah. So right now our focus is multifamily acquisitions and we're uh, moving into um, some development as well. So we're uh, working on acquiring some site control and some lots that we can do multifamily development on and also build to rent. But um, what we're working on right now is we've done a couple of syndication deals. Our last deal was a 22 unit deal, which we were able to just utilize a uh, credit union and um, for anyone that has that kind of like small balance loan, which is like, you know, 1 million to like six and a half million. Um, if you're able to just go to a credit union or a smaller bank, you know, locally, I think those are really good loans that you can negotiate some favorable terms on. So for example, uh, we know we knew that the capital markets were going to shift, interest rates were going to shift. So what we did was we we uh, locked in a, a three and a 3.75% interest rate interest only for the first three years. And then five years after that, it would be fixed at 3.75. And it just gets repriced every five years thereafter um, based off of, you know, five-year treasury for, um, plus a spread, right? Um, so that little things like that, I think, um, are a great way to make deals pencil in today's environment because everyone is chasing multifamily and yields keep getting thinner and thinner. I think ever now more than ever, given the fact that there's a shock in the real estate environment on an interest rate perspective, I think right now is a great time to pull out your toolkit and utilize maybe seller financing, loan assumptions, all of the different things that I think can help boost your deal in any way possible. Because the way that interest rates have risen is at, in such a dramatic, um, you know, velocity. Um, pricing really hasn't adjusted as, as high as interest rates have gone up. So if you want to still keep doing deals, you're going to have to be a little bit creative, right? Find ways to kind of tra- uh, be a transaction engineer or jump into um, deals that have some sort of maybe uh, additional risk, you know, repurposing, adaptive reuse, maybe development type of deal to make deals, you know, pencil for your investors as well. So, um, now more than ever, it's just really important to put on that that hat um, as a real estate investor. So what would you say to the real estate investors that um, are seeing the interest rates go up, seeing maybe some of the demand for housing cool off a little bit, um, and maybe they're some of your investors and they come to you and say, Yannick, um, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant about this market. Should I invest or not? And what, what would you say to some of the, the questions or the concerns about the current market to some, uh, how would you yeah. respond to some of those questions? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think now more than ever is really important to vet your sponsor and figuring out like who you're investing with because the tailwinds behind multifamily is it's, it's, it's coming, it's coming to an end, right? Um, no longer can you kind of just jump in a deal and get out of it and two extra capital, right? You really have to um, know what you're doing operationally. To, to make deals work today. And so the first thing I would say is just figure out like the, if you're, if whoever you're, that you're investing with, figure out like if that person is the real deal, right? Can they actually perform? Can they actually like execute? Because that's going to have a major impact on, um, I think your, your ability to be successful within your investment. Um, and then I think too, you know, it's always a good time to buy real estate because of obviously the tax benefits and the cash flow and all the things that, you know, the inflation heads, all the benefits that that real estate has to offer. 
Um, it's just a matter of just finding the right deal that makes sense. And then also part of that too is obviously debt kills all the real estate deals, right? And so if you don't know, if you're getting into a deal where the debt isn't placed in the most astute uh, way possible, you're definitely putting your capital up against risk on, on, on loss of principal. So I would think, you know, those three things, if you kind of focus on that, I think you would kind of put your, put your, put yourself in the, in the right position to be successful within your, your, within your investment. Yeah. Excellent advice. All right. So what are some of your, what are some of your goals for the next couple of years? Yeah. So our, our goal, our goal is to get to a thousand units within the next two years. Fantastic. And, um, you know, part of that may be development. Part of that may be value add multifamily. Um, we're just at a point right now where we're just starting to open up the, open up where we're investing, the locations that we're investing in. So right now, all of our deals have been in Baltimore and we kind of had this goal of like vertically integrating and just scaling up from there. But um, the challenge with that is that you, you're kind of limited in the deals that you're actually able to get if you're kind of just focused in one area. And so part of that is, is it just goes in line with just expanding and talking to different operators and just networking with different people. And, um, you know, that's that's kind of how you have to play in today's environment, because um, at least on my end, I'm, I'm starting to see kind of deals, um, deal flow kind of slow down a little bit. But, um, you know, obviously, if you kind of open that up and you leverage partnership and leverage other operators that have access to deal flow, you can certainly open up that pipeline and open up that network. So um, that's what that's what we're excited about. You know, I think um, part of part of what we want to do is also just continue to, to make additional impact within the community. And a lot of our deals are in the affordable housing space. So just uh, providing good. I think I think if you're able to provide good, affordable, clean, not necessarily like fancy, it can be granite countertops, nice cabinets. You know, nice, uh, you know, full set appliances and, you know, all of the little things that you might that might look nice just from a Home Depot. I think affordability is the biggest amenity in rental housing today. You know, and I, I think the, 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 the biggest long term crisis in how is housing in in America today. And so I think if you're just able to kind of position yourself within that market, not necessarily like high price, but like just on the affordable line. I think given the fact that people are unable to buy a home in today's environment and um, there's a housing shortage and it likely will continue to be over the long term, I think you're going to um, feel that demand over a long period of time if you know what you're doing. And obviously, if you know, if, if you're putting good product in the market. Excellent. All right. So any last advice for, um, first-time investors out there that um that have stumbled across this um, podcast has stumbled across maybe you and your team um what advice do you have for some first-time in investors i would say the biggest advice is you know don't try to do everything by yourself that is one of the things that i stumbled uh i struggled with when i first jumped into real estate specifically real estate syndication because there's so many moving hats in the commercial real estate space you know, you have to find a deal, somebody has to underwrite it, somebody has to raise the capital. The asset management is a piece that people don't really know or, or talk about because it's not like the sexy part of like real estate investing, right? You, we, we have to acquire the deal first and raise the capital and actually get the deal to operate. So there's not a lot of um, um, education on that side of things. And so I say that to say, you know, definitely find a way to jump in and, and leverage a team. Because if you think that you're going to do it all by yourself, you like you you probably can, but you're not going to get as far as you can unless you, as far as you can in, in a short amount of time as you probably want to, unless you're able to latch on to a team of other experienced operators or people who are actually doing it. Because now you get to use one of life's precious um, things to offer, which is leveraging time, right? leveraging experience right and so i think that's the biggest advice if i was to kind of turn things back i i, I should have kind of just leveraged someone someone's experience as quickly as possible and just kind of focus on like one thing maybe that's capital raising because that's a huge piece that you know you have to know how to do to just 
really play in this game. So I think that's the biggest advice that I would give to someone that's starting off in the syndication space. Man, that's fantastic advice. So yeah, I so I invest. I've been investing in real estate since oh uh, five. So from oh five to fifteen, I did everything by myself, and that limited me to just doing single family, maybe some fourplexes here and some smaller multifamily thing. But I wasn't able to start scaling until I started having partnerships and started syndication. So I was in 2015. So now I've got so many partners. Yeah. I got partners in Carolina, Georgia, Florida, uh, Phoenix. And um, I, I, maybe that's our temperament, maybe because we're, we're in, uh, we're in um, team sports. So we like having yeah. team and we're able to, and we thrive in working in a team envir- environment, but yeah, I I've yet to see a or hear of a very very successful real estate business or um, entrepreneur that did it by themselves they've always had some mentor some coach some mastermind some networking some partners uh and that's the yeah. the common thread among all the, even the multi-billion dollar um companies they all started out with part with partners yeah yeah, yeah definitely definitely not. and i always like to say i always like to look at things like from a um, 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 you know, a realistic perspective to some degree, right? If you, if you, if this is the game that you want to play, because some people don't want that, uh, that responsibility of like answering to investors and like doing bigger deals. Some people just want to play in a single family space. And if that's what you want to do, then by all means, just do do that. But if you want to get in on larger deals and, and do bigger transactions, definitely a team is the way to go because you're going to run into a lot of headwinds that are are going to kind of slow you down and make you frustrated. Uh, so definitely a team is where you want to be. Yep. Yeah. And even, even joining the mastermind. So that that's how we know each other from uh, raise masters mastermind. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just joined uh, three months ago in that mastermind and my mind has just gone to another level. Just be on this mastermind. I've been in real estate for so long and just being a part of other um, around other amazing um entrepreneurs like yourself just changes your whole mentality and on how to think and how to grow. Um, so yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm just, you're preaching to the choir over here. Yes. <laughs> Don't try to do it by yourself. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, fantastic advice. Yeah. I totally agree. Totally agree. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I guess uh, where can the listeners uh, find you and get in contact with you and, and your business? Yeah. So our company is in Maryland acquisitions m-e-r-l-y-n-n acquisitions.com uh, we have a free passive guide for people who are interested in getting into real estate syndication so go to merlin acquisitions.com slash passive guide um and i'm always happy to to you know talk to anyone about getting into real estate or just investing in real estate in general so um yeah that really gets me excited so thanks so much for having me on the show Excellent. Yep. And I definitely want you back on once you hit that 1000 mark. So reach back out to me and let's talk about how you hit that 1000 units and we'll be, and have you back on the show. We'll do it for sure. Excellent. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of the wealth building strategies podcast.